Okay. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much uh, for uh, for joining during this lunchtime session. I know I'm interrupting the most important part of the conference, which is people talking with each other uh, and not necessarily listening to me. Um, but um, I, I do have the special pleasure of introducing Dr. Vivek Law. He's the Chief Executive Officer for General Atomics Global Corporation in uh, beautiful San Diego. Um, and he sends his regrets because uh, he had to uh, still stay on the West Coast, uh, but still wanted to participate in this important event. Um, uh, Vivek uh, is, a, is a really interesting guy with a large background in a wide variety of technology areas. Uh, General Atomics, as some of you may know, does unmanned aircraft systems, uh, satellite systems, high-powered laser, hypervelocity hyper projectiles, all kinds of things that I, as a space guy, uh, really uh, am also interested in. His broad experience uh, at U.S. aerospace companies, Lockheed and uh, Boeing, uh, as well as, uh, of course, being in, uh, at General Atomics now. So the topic is talking about the roles of, of technology and maybe talk maybe a little bit about the, the role of the diaspora, which uh, you know, was brought up just a bit earlier, and, uh, and role in trade. Uh, but let me pause uh, right now and turn over to, to Vivek. Uh, Vivek, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, it's an honor to be introduced by you. Um, and thank you, Alyssa, for uh, the invitation. Again, my apologies, I'm not in there in person but I'm speaking to you from San Diego uh, and hope to meet many of you on my next trip to DC. Um, so uh, relative to the topic on high-tech collaboration and defense from a US-India perspective, uh, we all know India has made major progress in a number of advanced technology fields and will continue to do so um, in order to expand the technological base remain a leader in the Indo-Pacific region. This, of course, includes a need to diversify and create additional scientific and technological institutions that attract global talent to further strengthen its indigenous capability in cutting edge technologies and basic sciences. The logical approach, of course, is to deal, to deal with the situation is to strengthen existing ties between India and the United States, especially by moving into more substantive collaborations with high technology content. With India's demographics and industrial might complementing US technological entrepreneurism, the two nations form a natural partnership. Given our shared values, this relationship enjoys strong bipartisan support in both countries and there is great merit to expanding the partnership framework toward a knowledge-based economy through formal collaboration and high-tech areas of common interest. I believe moving forward in three areas in which international collaboration has long proven successful would be national defense, energy, as well as space, three fields in which both the countries are already working together. Because progress in such High technology areas is strongly correlated to overall economic prosperity. Properly established cooperation should help keep the two countries at the forefront of the future international political, economic, and social order. Moreover, successful collaborations in these areas is likely to spawn a number of joint India-US efforts in other matters of mutual interest, for example, health, education, information technology, climate change, so forth. Delving a little bit into the defense side of things, defense has emerged as a major pillar over the years, as all of us know, not only in defense trade, but joint exercises, personal exchanges, maritime security, counter piracy. Um, there have been various watershed moments in terms of India being declared as a major defense partner. Uh, India was elevated to strategic trade authorization tier one status. Um, there have been foundational agreements like Lamoa, Concasa, Beka that have been signed. Taken together, these long established ties and new forward looking pacts establish the framework needed to push ahead with extensive collaboration on a number of high-tech defense activities of mutual interests to both nations. 
So whether we're talking about intelligence churn, modern military systems, there has been a, a giant leap in uh, joint capability and activity. The other area, of course, is energy as a national security imperative. And even in energy, we have seen great strides um, from a bilateral perspective, uh, whether renewable energy, and I think there's a lot of potential for advanced nuclear fission reactors, as well as nuclear fusion. Um, those are areas, again, ripe for U.S. and India to collaborate. Uh, I'll come to space because that's, of course, of personal great interest, and, um, and, and I see a lot of potential there. The U.S., of course, is a pioneer in advancing and implementing space technology. Building on the successes of its satellite and moon exploration programs, India is now also joining the ranks of the world leaders in this area. Moreover, there is a strong history of collaboration between NASA and ISRO, which forms a firm foundation for pursuing future collaboration with greater high-tech content. In my view, the most propitious path for such collaboration are Earth monitoring and long-term manned missions. Earth monitoring efforts in support of data gathering for climate change are already underway, as you know. As a worldwide concern about global warming grows, there will be an increasing need for additional satellites to quantify a host of effects on the Earth's surface. India and the US form an especially strong team to take the lead in this area because of expertise in launch and instrumentation technology. Developing space qualified instruments has been a boon to US universities and has helped energize young scientists and engineers around the future of space innovation. The same pattern can be expected in India. India has aggressive plans for manned space flight and will soon join the exclusive club of nations who have accomplished this objective. The US plans for deep space exploration are still taking shape under the Army's mission to establish the first long-term presence on the moon in preparation for the next giant leap, sending the first astronauts to Mars. At the center of this mission is addressing the energy challenge. In the case of Mars Voyage, the flight time needs to be short enough that astronaut health will not be threatened by the increased radiation dose rate. In the case of sustainable colonies, the need is for a surface energy source that can last for years, but is light enough to launch. In both cases, the favored answer is nuclear technology. Compared to chemical rockets, nuclear propulsion allows for broader launch windows and ability to abort missions. Travel time is reduced materially once in orbit. Nuclear thermal propulsion allows twice the amount of thrust force for flow rate of propellant, and nuclear electric propulsion enables an even higher specific impulse and order of magnitude faster trip times, a must for interstellar exploration. Sustaining a colony on another world without a need of, for solar capture or mining of fuel is best accomplished by fission energy sources in a relatively small package. Today, the development of requisite nuclear technologies for space missions is at an early stage. Active collaboration with India would spur the pace of development. Earlier, earlier I mentioned that there's a lot of synergies in, in various areas, but I certainly think nuclear capabilities and ambitions of both countries in this regard, and in particular at the application, um, has a lot of merit to be considered. Another area that since we hear about artificial intelligence so much um, increasingly in our in whatever aspect and domain one is talking about, but I do believe for like-minded nations like the US and India to have the artificial intelligence based capabilities that will empower the defense system automation and autonomy need to confront our ad adversaries we do need a multi-intelligence synthetic data generation system to satiate the training data requirements for peace and wartime missions. 
This will address today's three primary limitations of costly data collection of peacetime missions, data labeling, and access to data sets for wartime missions. By defining and implementing an open architecture with standardized interfaces, like-minded nations like US and India can participate spanning government, industry, and academia and maximize collaboration and accelerate such, such development. In conclusion, I'd just like to mention, of course, R&D and innovation is at the, at the very core of what I see a great growth path for both the countries. Investment in R&D is only one aspect as an effective portfolio of policies to foster innovation spanning regulatory, taxation, and other matters, as well as fiscal allocations. It underscores the need for continued and enhanced active involvement by both governments in nurturing science and technology-based innovation in the public as well as the private sector, and therefore also increasing employment in relatively well-paid high-tech industries in the countries. I am truly amazed at the great startup community in technology in India and the kind of um, ambition and capability that uh, has spawned out of India. And we, for example, are partnered with a couple of startups in artificial intelligence and semiconductors, and they're truly world-class. Strengthening these assets is wise public policy that will stimulate economic growth and contribute broadly to national prosperity in the coming years. As I like to say, no one country has a lock on the best ideas. If the next generation of scholars and experts are to save the globe and not just one country, collaboration is essential. India and the US are perfectly positioned to lead the way. Thank you. Okay, Vivek, uh, thank you uh, very much. Um, let me let me start by uh, maybe posing uh, a couple of questions. Uh, you know, in the U.S. Uh, system, we have a strong role uh, for universities and also for private sector uh, investment in, in R and D. And uh, someone can correct me, but my understanding in India that there's a lot of government funding of of R and D uh, is is very very dominant. Um, what do you see as the U.S. being able to, or U.S. companies being able to do? Uh, if anything, in terms of fostering greater utilization of Indian, not only entrepreneurial talent, as you mentioned, uh, but also un Indian university uh, talent in that cooperation. I think you bring up an outstanding point, Scott. I think for, for collaboration, I, I view six stakeholder buckets. One is the political spectrum on both sides. The second is the bureaucratic spectrum. The third is the often missed but very very critical and that's what you're referring to is the academia think tank community and the collaboration therein and 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 really to work with the fourth piece which was the industry captains on both sides um and then of course um you know you have the, the media and the communications piece as well and eventually the six being the the end user and the stakeholder who's going to who sees a value to pay for for whatever the innovation is, um, and so I think um, it's increasingly happening. But I do think that the uh, academic community, as well in India, as well as uh, you know the universities and institutes, they will increasingly be an important catalyst. Uh, just like in the United States, to to work with uh, U.S. and Indian industry, but also to work across with U.S. universities in many areas of uh, specific uh, innovation. And the second question um, is, uh, of course, you stress the role of, uh, of like-minded uh, countries and the increasingly uh, warm relationship between the U.S. Um, and India. Um, but at the same time, of course, India has a long history uh, of uh, role of, of the importance of non-alignment uh, in this. And so there may be fundamental limitations to how far, uh, you know, India wants to go uh, in terms of relationship with the uh, with the U.S. 
Um, what do you see as the other countries, promising countries for partnership in defense and aerospace other than the United States uh, for India? Yeah, I think um, the quad framework has been talked about in, uh, in the earlier comments here. I do think there's a very strong uh, tie-in for Japan, Australia, India, and the U.S., in the Indo-Pacific region to really collaborate on many things. And I know there have been several quad initiatives. Uh, I'm, I'm also on the board of the quad um, investors network. And one of the um, ideas there is to, to not just foster um, more technology cooperation, but bring the wherewithal from a financial perspective to, to um, to support some of that. Um, I think the startup communities in all these countries I mentioned is is, is eager to, to go to the next level. There's a lot of hand-holding, a mentor-protege type relationship that needs to occur. But I certainly see uh, a great synergistic um, effort between uh, US, India, Japan, and Australia to move the ball ahead in various critical and emerging technologies areas, whether it's uh, quantum computing, quantum sensing, whether it is uh, space, whether it is artificial intelligence, I do see that uh, there, there's a general uh, like-mindedness on, on what the objective should be. Very good. Uh, well, let me pause and look for a, a question, sir. Can we get the microphone? Maybe I have one. <laughs> A simple question. Can R&D in defense, space, biotechnology can be outsourced to India, just like auditing, accounting, various services are being outsourced to India and also the outsourcing in biotechnology that is take, going to China already can be turned around. So it's a it's private to private outsourcing. Okay. Yes, I, I mean I do see a lot of that happening. Uh, R and D, uh, there are two components: research and development. I mean you have basic applications of research, and then how do you take that research and make that um, liable into technology and so forth. So I do think R&D just by its nature when we lump both of those aspects together is collaborative and not necessarily something you can package and throw over the fence and, and outsource. So I do see more of a collaborative model um, stitched together that'll yield quicker results because uh, there is a role for research, but then you, you do have to get into the development and development cycles in today's world are shrinking. So if you're going to pursue something, pursue it quick, fail fast or, or succeed, we do not have the luxury of, you know, tens of years of going, going into a particular area. As you can see, the world we live in, we need quick solutions. We need uh, cost-effective solutions. And uh, especially in the domains that we we're talking about. And so uh, the cycle times are very short, which necessarily means R&D with a purpose and it has to be collaborative. Okay, very good. Um, one of the things that um, the Indian defense industry has struggled with is getting consistent number of orders to actually sustain larger supply chains and uh, and that itself is also a constraint on the kinds of R&D they can really commit to. Um, what ways can the US and India and, and other partners really commit to uh, in increasing orders or increasing demand for, for Indian defense goods? Because without which, you know, India will, it's, it will struggle to set up such a supply chain. Yeah, that's a good question. I think there's an increased focus on co-development projects, co-production projects, and the six stakeholder buckets that I mentioned. It's very important that upfront 
they're all aligned on kind of what, what the direction is and what are the top priority technologies that one is working on. And um, I do feel that um, the environment now is ripe for, uh, you know, taking the next leap into co-development and co-production because that, that in itself, um, whether it's a U.S. industry or, or Indian industry or the both the governments involved, will bring focus and will then over time generate the requisite orders that are needed to sustain this. Yeah, I, and I think you can also look at examples in NATO of trying to get uh, standardization on common you know, platforms. And even, even in NATO, it's, it's hard to do that to get uh, you know, economic production lines. Uh, so it would seem that the, the, the first thing is to uh, agree upon uh, weapon system specification, interfaces, architecture, you know, kind of things um, that then it would allow for making production decisions on a much wider basis. But that would require a, de a degree of political alignment and an agreement that, again, I think would would pose challenges for India traditionally uh, to get there. I, but I think the co-production approach, as Vivek described, might be a, a way to start that. Um, yeah, let me... Oh, it's coming. Oh. Hilton Root, George Mason University. Uh, I wonder if you care to comment a little bit more about India's um, geoeconomic alignment, particularly Russia, and whether that creates some kind of a ceiling on the possibility of fully developing a, a relationship with um, American uh, sources. I have been an observer of the U.S.-India defense relationship and, and, and been part of it for the last 20 odd years. And the level of trust, the level of sophistication in terms of the agreements that have been put in place, um, the common objectives, the democratic principles we both work on, give me great hope that... Um, the trajectory has has yielded, as, as you know, there's been over $25 billion of trade between both countries in in um, in defense and, and, and only growing. I think there's a common realization between the US and India that it is a strong partnership in defense that will lay the foundation for, for the rest of the century. And I do think that um, whether we are talking about nuts and bolts R and D or, or, or basic technologies to platforms to interoperability, which you know many years ago that that was not part of the lingo, but now interoperability becomes very important, and indeed people are talking about interchangeability. I think I think the trajectory is very robust and very strong for the U.S. India relationship. I might also just comment that um, there are there are certainly friction points with respect to Russia in terms of uh, following sanctions, you know, issues like you know oil trade and and so forth. But in terms of space, which is what I probably know more about, and Vivek knows more, much more about, um, you know, Russia is really as is much less of a player. Uh, the Russian space industry has declined really dramatically. A variety of reasons for that. Um, so the past kind of balance that India used to have, say, between the U.S. and Russia, or the Soviet Union, really isn't there anymore because the space aspect of Russia has declined so much. And you're not going to see the cooperation, uh, you know, being replaced by India-China cooperation. Um, so it seems like the quad uh, is, is probably the best option for India, you know, in, in my opinion. But there was a question back there. Uh, thank you for the talk, Dr. Veklang. I'm Ravi. Uh, I also uh, lead a technology company and uh, applying artificial intelligence. So my question was, um, you kind of touched upon the uh, uh, problems of applying like AI in synthetic data generation uh, and wanted to double click on that and understand uh, any specific use cases that you see um, and problems emerge that could be solved 
uh, spe apply to aeronautics and like applications for thereof. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question, uh, Ravi. The you know the typical process today, when using real world data sets collected from real platforms, whether they're aircraft or satellites, can be generalized in the following steps. Right, one is the corpus of data respond corresponding to the desired artificial intelligence or machine uh, machine learning model training. The second would be to organize and curate the data. The third would be to label the data such that the items of interest, whether they're targets, uh, objects, behaviors, they're all identified in each piece of, uh, of the data in the corpus. And the fourth piece is to train the AI model, of course, with the labeled data corpus. Now, all this can be really expensive. And, and I think the challenge will be on the data side. So I'm sure you and your company and others are all working towards it, but certainly in the defense mission space, this will increasingly become an area of uh, focus because I do think we will be getting to multi-intelligence uh, ISR data sources that uh, uh, is, is beyond any one nation and like-minded nations will have to um, work on it together. Very good, Got a question front. Hi, uh, this is a question uh, looking at the strategic competition between America and China and the role of defense in, uh, in addressing that challenge. And the question for me is that it appears that in an in a economic defense competition between two countries of roughly equal economic size, which China is approaching America in that regard, the game will be won or lost based upon the fundamental economic efficiency of our defense infrastructure or defense companies. So uh, I take as a data point here that uh, your company just got uh, its most recent award, 36 predator drones for $7.2 billion, which we do the math is $200 million plain. Um, and then to look at the question of US-India relationship, my question is this, do you see any prospect for improving the overall economic efficiency of our defense contractors by collaborating with lower cost countries like India so that America can take whatever number of dollars it wishes to spend, likewise India and other uh, like-minded countries and get the most bang for the buck? So is there a way to make our uh, collaboration focused on the question of cost and not just on the ability of technology, which is I, I recognize and accept that that's a very important part in warfare. Right, so I'm, I'm not familiar with the specifics of, of the transaction you're talking about, but uh, I'll give you an overall response. Um, I think as a industry and as a business, uh, no matter which sector, one is always looking at increasing innovation and lowering costs. Um, and certainly in the defense industry, that's no, no different. And um, as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, that is why I see a great synergy between US and India. When you bring innovation and doing things at, at a cost-effective price point. I mean, we talk about India's space program and all of us know of what they have achieved and on, on what budgets. So it's remarkably successful. Um, and so I think there are a lot of learnings both ways. And I think as we push the frontiers of technology and the next generation technologies, Therefore, I'm such a strong believer in U.S.-India relationships because they will speak to your, the point you're making, which is economic efficiency, which is lower cycle times, which is innovation at, uh, and providing the better cost points um, because otherwise it's not sustainable. Yeah, I would, I would say it, though it is that there is certainly that argument about cost effectiveness and the importance of a defense industrial base 
is absolutely great. Uh, if India could maybe supply some more 155 millimeter shells uh, to supplement our supply in Arkansas, uh, that would probably be really immediately helpful. Um, but um, uh, the problem becomes it's really a political perception issue. So economics drove, uh, of course, uh, shifting manufacturing to China, uh, which arguably led to a number of deleterious effects in the US. And now we have a backlash to that. And so the degree to which both India and the US can domestically support cooperation. So what may look like a great idea economically uh, may not be politically doable. There's issues of perceptions of balance, perceptions of alliance relationships, degrees of trust, that sort of, that sort of thing. Um, and although I don't think it's anywhere near, there is a potential risk in some of these areas like uh, in AI um, for you know, India to wind up in the same category as China in terms of perceptions in the US not, not being favorable. Um, so I, I think uh, that's a low chance, but it's, it's a real chance. Uh, and so how do we blend the sort of economic arguments with sort of the political arguments? And I think Vivek, you know, like your role in, in the Quad initiatives and your role uh, you know, here in the US and various advisory groups is really important to sort of building that sense of trust uh, between, because we can say like-minded, but people have to live it um, in, in order to, uh, to to go forward with it. But, sorry, speech. Let's see. Well, is there, well, Vic, I wanted to ask one thing on a barrier. Um, one of the big barriers we have in space cooperation with Japan on both uh, security and even civil thing sometimes is, uh, is cybersecurity. Uh, you know, we uh, aerospace industry just tend to be very critical of cybersecurity uh, capabilities that share. So even though politically we're very aligned with Japan, um, the cybersecurity is a real risk and, and has been an impediment. Um, what's your assessment of India's cybersecurity and how much of an impediment do you think that is to closer U.S.-India defense cooperation? That's an outstanding point, Scott. And and you're right. Cybersecurity is, despite all the best will politically and otherwise, um, it is an area of uh, high watch. I think um, learning from the experiences and continued experiences with other like-minded nations, like you mentioned, Japan, I think there is a recognition there in, in the U.S. India dialogue as well from a space perspective. Um, but yes, if, if there was one issue um, that would be front and center uh, to, to address as we march along here, I, I would completely agree with you. It's cybersecurity. Okay. Maybe we have time for one more question. Um, who wants to try? Okay. We have one brave soul. Go for it. Um, okay, so my question is regarding security. Um, you've talked a lot about, you know, the US and India collaborating with regards to, you know, like new space technologies and their development and the development of them. Um, so I guess my only question is, to what extent do you think, I mean, the US's like fears about, you know, like technology sharing, like, you know, with like, say, like the F-22 Raptor or stuff like that, you know, what to what extent does that inhibit, or I guess, what to what extent does it prevent U.S. Uh, you know, like tech tech sharing, or like you know, it's, I guess, ability to get involved in that. Yeah. So, um, as I mentioned over the last couple of decades, the 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 relationship has really formed in terms of trust and technology and intelligence sharing and so forth. Um, you know, it's a it's a work in progress. There are several government entities on this side as well as on the Indian side that continuously work and through uh, various issues in order to get to a place of increased uh, collaboration. But certainly, it is a you know it's a greater process, and it's a it's one that affects national security, uh, and and so it's a very very deliberative process. However, I can say, having observed all those elements that 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 come together or need to come together to um, just some of those watershed moments that I mentioned in my earlier remarks indicates how quickly we have converged to a place where 
Today, we can talk about things we couldn't talk about five, 10 years ago as countries and as industries. And so I, I think that track will continue. Will there still be issues that need to get resolved from export control and other standpoints? Of course, and that, that's an ongoing uh, ongoing work in progress. Yeah, I would I would say in the narrow of looking at say uh, say just on space side of things, um, the the Indian Space Research Organization used to have an entity called Antrix, which was kind of like the revenue generating arm. It would go out and and sell products like remote sensing images and so forth, and they tended to compete against Indian firms. Well, Antrix is gone. There's an Indian sort of space promotion entity now. And so in the glass half full sense, the Indian government, I think, has made some really remarkable uh, progress and steps uh, to um, sort of push government back into a uh, maybe what we would consider a more normal stance and to not compete with Indian companies and promote Indian companies. So that's the good news. The bad news is the issue of foreign direct investment of you know, everything from data localization permits getting stuff in. So. The issue of opening up India uh, to part of this sort of global supply chain is still a work in progress. But I think an important first step is made where the Indian government has at least not competed uh, with its own its own entities. Uh, Russia, for example, made a different decision. In the 90s and early 2000s, there were private sector Russian space entities that were largely crushed uh, by the state enterprises. And so there really isn't a private commercial sector, uh, entrepreneurial sector in space in, in Russia. Uh, China is looking to encourage something like that. India has taken steps toward that, um, but still is not part of uh, sort of, I think, the broader uh, global supply chains. But, but I think the political conditions are moving in a direction where maybe that will happen. Um, but with that, I'm, I'm seeing we're at, uh, at our time. Uh, Vivek, uh, really great to see you. I uh, hope to see you in D.C. soon. Uh, and we could a round of applause for our, our keynote. Thank you, Scott.